It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Are you familiar with The New Atheists? The late Christopher Hitchens wrote biting books about religion as poison. Richard Dawkins has championed a sort of scientism as a replacement for faith. And people like Bill Maher spend some time each evening poking fun at the pious. Despite their unofficial title, New Atheists, they're actually not all that new. Award-winning historian Lee Eric Schmidt sees them as ancestors of village atheists of days gone by. Atheists in American history have often been at the forefront of debates about the necessity of religion for healthy social life. They've fought legal battles over free speech and minority rights. And in this episode, you'll hear Schmidt tell the stories of four controversial folks who called themselves free thinkers. Stories of integrity and courage, humor and hypocrisy. We're talking about Lee Eric Schmidt's new book, Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation, in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Send questions and comments about this and other episodes to mipodcast at byu.edu. And don't forget to rate and review the show in iTunes. Lee Eric Schmidt is here. He joins us from the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. And today we're talking about his new book, Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. Lee, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. I wanted to begin with the way that your book begins. You talk about the Boy Scouts of America, of all things, right off the top. And in, in 2015, the Boy Scouts of America lifted its ban on gay scout leaders, but uh, this ban against atheist scout leaders remains. Talk a little bit about uh, introducing the book that way. Well, I wanted a contemporary example that would suggest that these issues around how non-believers are treated in the culture are still alive. I mean, in some ways, we think that this principle of neutrality that the courts have established in the middle decades of the 20th century somehow resolve this as a problem in the culture, that believers and non-believers would be treated on equal terms before the law. But in all kinds of ways, in voluntary societies, um, just in terms of social relationships and social trust, the issue of how atheists fare in American life is still very much alive. And the Boy Scouts is an example of that. Um, and just the wider polling on that is that there is still a lot of suspicion aimed at atheists uh, and unbelievers. They, you know, in terms of whether they should hold public office, whether they could be a viable presidential candidate, they're still one of the most distrusted, if not the most distrusted group in American life. It's really interesting. There's this Pew data from 2014 where they assessed something called the feelings thermometer. They sort of asked Americans how they felt about different religious groups and, and atheists as well. And atheists, um, they rank a percentage point above Muslims in that survey, I think 41% versus 40%. And they're seven percentage points below Mormons. So the least three warmly thought of groups on the survey are Mormons, then atheists, and then Muslims. W what do you make of that sort of assessment? by Pew. Right. Well, it's very telling that you have that kind of cultural suspicion out there for all three groups. I mean, there is some data now, right, that Muslims are polling lower than atheists. Atheists used to consistently poll the lowest. That That's changed a little bit. Mormons, of course, uh, have a long history of uh, that kind of suspicion aimed at them. Uh, it's still inherited out of the 19th century, and it's persisted here into the 21st century. So, so this is a, a triumvirate um, that shares together in that kind of suspicion and problems out there around uh, social trust. And then it comes up in these measures. I mean, people will pull things like not just whether you'd want an atheist or a Muslim or a Mormon as president, but they pull things like, would you be concerned if your son or daughter brought an atheist or a Muslim, you know, or a Mormon home as, as a date or potential uh, in-law, and the suspicion is on, on those matters as well. So it's, it, it cuts across a lot of um, areas of social life, these kinds of suspicions. And you mentioned the idea of an atheist president uh, as a hypothetical, and I think polls still show that it's a bigger stretch for an atheist to become a president than any of these other categories of religion, including, as of 2014 at least, including Muslims, Mormons, and so forth. Um, this is sort of this American context. America, a lot of people thinking of, of this country as a, as a Christian nation, but when they say that, they're largely largely referring to this Protestant majority. Talk a little bit about that context and, and how that, how those, it seems to be on the wane a little bit. 
It is to some degree on the wane. I, I mean, atheist candidates are faring a little bit better in the polling. I mean, they're not disqualified automatically by as many Americans. I mean, one of the factors there, I think, is that we do have a growing number of Americans who are religiously disaffiliated. That group has grown remarkably over the last 20 years, going from you know under 10% of the population to about 25% of the population. So that you have this large group of Americans now who don't claim a clear religious identity, aren't affiliated with the religious community in any way. So as those numbers have gone up, there has been some attenuation of these numbers uh, in regard to atheists uh, in public office and public life. So I think there is, um, if that group continues to grow, and, and a lot of sociologists think it will continue to grow, there might you know, be up getting close to 30% of the population at this point. That should take away some of the reservations Americans have about unbelievers, about people who don't have a clear religious identity or or are actively opposed to having one. So those things are lining up, and I think that makes a difference. Also, the end of the Cold War made a real difference. I mean, uh, there was a high watermark of suspicion of atheists during the Cold War because they were associated with godless communists. Once the Cold War is at an end, there's less of that. Atheists don't have to constantly tell people, no, we're not necessarily godless communists. We're not, as, you know, we're not on the side of Soviets. So that that's changed too. So there have been some things that make it uh, likely that those percentages of distrust will continue to go down. One of the interesting distinctions that you make throughout the book is in regards to religious liberty, the idea that America is this land of religious liberty. And you talk about legal elements of that, but there's also social elements of that. And I think this sort of connects to what you've been talking about in regards to like an atheist president, for example. There aren't any legal stipulations against that, but despite talk of religious liberty, there's also these social barriers that still exist. It's interesting to think about this, the religious liberty in America as a legal issue, but also a social issue. And the picture is a lot more complex when you think about those different elements. Right, right. So, th so on the legal side, I mean, there is significant clarification after this case in 1961, the Roy Torqueso uh, case that the Supreme Court decided. He wanted to be a notary public in Maryland. The Maryland state constitution still required testifying to a belief in God in order to, to serve uh, in public life. And he challenged that and he lost in the state courts. And then when it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that the ban on religious tests were also applicable to the states. And Maryland can no longer enforce this ban against atheists being notary publics or being um, holders of offices uh, of public trust. So that really made a big difference legally. But the social issues, it can't resolve that. I mean, those are issues that go on in families, that go on in the workplace, that go on in the business community. I mean, there are, there are a lot of stories uh, in the 19th century and into the 20th century that atheists and unbelievers and free thinkers felt that they were subject to Christian boycotts in their businesses, that they set up a business in a small town, they gain a reputation for being a free thinker and an infidel, and the next thing you know, nobody will shop in their store or um, their business goes way down. So those kinds of social elements are harder to resolve in, in many ways than the legal ones where the Supreme Court could come in and make a decision, but the social, the social issues persist. So the Supreme Court decisions and some of the legal issues that were resolved in the mid-20th century is sort of one end of the book. But you go back in time, back to the architects of the idea of religious liberty in, in the United States, and you talk about how prejudice against atheists and unbelievers goes deep there. And so the idea that America was this land of the free where people could worship according to the dictates of their own conscience is complicated uh, because when they would talk about religious tolerance, they, they would stipulate – uh, that that meant like you at least had to have some religion to tolerate. Like there wasn't tolerance for irreligion. I'm thinking of Locke, for example. Right, right. No, that's that's the, the key issue here is that for a long time when religious freedom is theorized, the claim is that this is about the freedom of religious belief, that that's where liberty of conscience comes into play. And if you don't have religious belief, if you're openly irreligious, these freedoms don't apply to you. So that 
was Locke's position uh, in his letter on toleration. It remained a commonplace uh, among political th theorists into the 19th century. Now, there were dissenters from that. Jefferson made the point that religious freedom should extend to infidels, that religious freedom included irreligious freedom. But for a lot of people um, beyond these Jeffersonian ranks, that was not a move they were willing to make. And they still believed that religious freedom did not include uh, irreligious liberty, that the rights of unbelievers were not protected in the same way that the rights of believers were. And so that, that issue lingers you know, into the 20th century as a, as a legal problem. And as I suggested, it's only in the Supreme Court cases in the middle decades of the 20th century uh, that we get some clarification on that in legal terms that religious freedom does include irreligious freedom. Yeah, and even then, some of the, as, as you said, some of those social discriminations still continue. So legal uh, issues can be resolved, but there could, uh, there's still, obviously, according to the polling, there's still a lot of stigma and a lot of problems that can be faced for uh, uh, for atheists or unbelievers or free thinkers or whatever uh, term we talk about them under. Um, let's talk about the 19th century Protestant moral order. This is something that you talk about as being the sort of religious and cultural context of the 19th century where these village atheists are going to pop up in. And instead of being a simple black and white story, you say this Protestant moral order is fissured with division is the phrase you use. So talk about that context a little bit. Right. Well, one of the pictures we have of the 19th century is just how strong this Protestant moral order is and how effective it would be at marginalizing infidels and unbelievers. And there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and, and once you get down to the local level, you see this time and again, you know, a village druggist who gets the reputation of being an unbeliever and a free thinker. And the next thing you know, somebody wants to uh, charge him with blasphemy uh, or um, harass him in other kinds of ways. So you, you see that, the, the strength of this. It works out in the way blasphemy is policed, in the way people think about uh, witness testimonies in the courtroom. Uh, and things like that. But at the same time, what you see is that as these infidel lectures grow in popularity in the late 19th century, Robert Ingersoll is the most famous, but there are dozens of these figures who are crisscrossing the country. A lot of the time, they're tolerated. Um, and they attract decent audiences and people are curious to listen to them and hear them. And they, they let them go about their uh, itineracy. Um, there, there's a certain civility that uh, is extended to them. So it's a mixed picture in that way. There is an element here where there's quite a bit of tolerance for these free thinkers. I mean, they can come into a lot of communities. They give their lectures over several days and they go on their way to the next town and, and are generally listened to all right there as well. Church folks might grumble about it. The occasional minister might denounce them from the pulpit. But on the whole, they get away with it. Um, there is a certain tolerance or forbearance extended to them. So that's that's what I would say is that it's it's a divided picture. I mean, you get enough episodes where there's real persecution on the ground in these locales when an itinerant free thinker shows up, um, occasionally mobbed or occasionally threatened with violence, but on the other hand, they're speaking all over the place dozens and dozens of times, and most of the time their performances go off without a hitch um, or, or, you know, or at least with minimum amount of opposition, um, nothing overt. Um, so that's my sense of it, that you get, you, you know, you can say that there is a lot of prejudice and there's potential for, you know, even violence against these free thinkers and infidels. But on the other hand, um, there's a certain openness, a curiosity about hearing their objections to the faith that seems to um, override the spirit of persecution that comes up at other times. And Lee, the book is about these village atheists. So earlier you mentioned Ingersoll, and he was kind of this really popular known atheist figure. I think today he might be compared with someone like Bill Maher or like Sam Harris or someone like this. It's sort of has pretty big megaphone. But village atheists are sort of more, you know, amongst the commoners, so to speak, or someone in your neighborhood or something. So what was the quintessential stereotypical village atheist? And how did that image sort of come to be? Well, the idea of the village atheists 
develops over the course of the 19th century. There are few allusions to this in the, in the antebellum period, the village blasphemer, the village atheist. Initially, it's just a figure of speech that's applied to the, these kind of deist scoffers. Maybe somebody gets a little drunk in the tavern and starts uttering blasphemous things about the Virgin Mary or Jesus. Um, so it, it's used in that kind of way, mostly negatively. In the late 19th century, you begin to get people who talk about it more positively or affectionately, that it's this lone nonconformist, someone willing to stand up to the powers that be in the community, to speak their mind, to be kind of creatively at an angle to popular opinion. So that, I mean, this doesn't mean Bill that it's become uniformly popular in that way, but enough people are starting to see it that way so that by the 1920s, you actually get an, almost a nostalgia for this kind of local contrarian, that the village atheist is this great character in American life who was willing to stand up to the reigning pieties and, and um, the complacency uh, in, in these towns and communities. So, so there is that kind of idealizing of their nonconformity that goes on in certain circles, Manwick Brooks and Sinclair Lewis and some others who who are you know, critics of what they would see as small town evangelical verities. And they look to these kinds of figures for a kind of crack in that moral world and that social world. So, yeah, it's kind of like these stock figures, too. Like you'd have the town drunk, you'd have like the preacher or the, like the busybody or – uh, the mayor, right. like these sort of – and the village atheist is one of these American characters that sort of exists alongside uh, these other figures. And I, I, I really think the book does a great job pointing out how the term does shift from one of just a negative, polemical, almost accusation to this term right. of nostalgia and as village atheists sort of waned and as the culture continued to shift. Mark Twain become, is a kind of a – you know, sometimes taken to be one um, – Van Wyck Brooks, when he's writing about Mark Twain in the 1920s, sees Twain is not quite living up to the ideal of the village atheist because he sometimes um, pulled his punches and delayed expression of his unbelief until a posthumous publication. But Mark Twain's sometimes seen as that. And in, in, in some of his uh, stories, you get a sense of the, what this local free thinker was like. Yeah. So, yeah. And we know how I idealized Mark Twain becomes as a character in American cultural life. So if you associate the village atheist with a kind of Twain-like character, you can see the affection that's possible for this kind of contrarian. That's Lee Eric Schmidt. We're talking about his book, Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. So this book um, takes kind of a biographical approach, almost you call it a group portrait approach, where each chapter focuses in on one particular example of a village atheist. Talk about how you decided to structure the book that way. It seems different from some of the past books that you've done, especially hearing things, highly acclaimed book. Talk about the uh, decision to structure the book this way. Yeah, I found these characters very colorful, and I wanted to write a um, you know character-driven account, I guess, of, of unbelief. So I, I found the biographical approach useful in that regard. I also then wanted to make choices, though, that would allow me to use a figure to explore a critical aspect of American secularist experience. So it wasn't just to tell a particular biographical story. I mean, I wanted distinct kind of figures that, that then would highlight in broad ways the core components of American secularism and American unbelief. So I was trying to make choices in that kind of way. It's always hard to make these kinds of choices. One of the first characters I talk about is Samuel Porter Putnam. And, he was an itinerant lecturer, uh, but he was also sort of the historian of the movement and wrote a thousand page book on free thinkers and really concentrated a lot on these American local characters. But when his book came out, even though it was a thousand pages long and he had dozens and dozens of biographical vignettes, people worried about, well, why did you choose that person and not this person mm -hmm. and, and so on. So it is, it is difficult to make these kinds of choices and feel like you're making the right choices. But the goal was to find a handful of figures that would then illustrate these core themes, uh, as I saw it uh, in American uh, secularist experience. So that was the ambition 
but there, you know, it's it's always a question it's whether you realize your ambition, right? With yeah. your, your choices. Well, I, I was impressed because it seems like a really hard thing to do because there's obviously going to be some overlap between these figures. You know, each figure, and we'll talk about each of them a little bit so people can get a sense for each of them. But each of them, yeah, you found a way to emphasize a particular point with each of them. But also, you also want to give a full picture of the person as well. So you, it seemed, I don't know, as I read, I just it seemed very tricky to me to not make it artificial, to be true to those individual figures, but to also emphasize the wider point that you felt was kind of a main theme of their ministry, so to speak, uh, right. without making them a cardboard cutout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, it's difficult. And right, you necessarily then end up muting parts of their career in order to draw out the central theme. Um, you know, in, if so if you're talking about like Charles Reynolds, who's one of my characters, he's convicted of blasphemy in this infamous trial in New Jersey in 1886. And so I concentrate there on on blasphemy law and the history of, of blasphemy accusations and how this played in the late 19th century. And, and so I use him to think about that legal conundrum and the big problem of whether the irreligious share in religious liberty or not. But in doing that, you necessarily don't talk nearly as much about, say, the last part of his career, which is he leaves New Jersey and leaves the East Coast and heads west and takes up residence for the last decade or so of his life in the Pacific Northwest, where he, he has an itinerancy out there between Seattle and Tacoma and Portland, Oregon, and organizes this Oregon Secular Union and this Washington Secular Union and has various causes he's pursuing out there. But you don't tell that story as much because you're really, you know, I'm interested in the blasphemy story. So those are the kinds of things you right. you. you get a selective biography necessarily because you're trying to use it to talk about something bigger um, than just the, the person's overall life. Right. Okay. And and one more thing before we dive in uh, to these individuals, let's talk a little bit about what I think what you call the architecture of secularism in the 19th century, sort of the ways by which these people associated and spread their messages and sort of learn from each other and connected. So there are several different aspects of this architecture. I'm thinking about the liberalizing Protestant movements, um, free thinking associations, and different media platforms. So kind of give people a sense of the architecture of secularism that existed before we dive into the individual people. Sure. Well, I mean, I do start with these liberalizing trends within Protestantism itself, so that you get a movement from, say, a waning Calvinist orthodoxy and congregationalism, and you move out to Unitarianism, and, and then from Unitarianism, you move out to these, these dissenters from that, so they get their own free societies or the free religious association where they no longer want to own the Christian name at all, at least within Unitarian circles. There's still a lively debate, and many of them are claiming still to be Christian, though Unitarian. Once you get out there to this free religious association or these independent societies, they see themselves as explicitly post-Christian. Um, and then you move, you know, further out where if those free, if the free religious association, those independent societies are already kind of open to to unbelief, then you get these organizations like the National Liberal League and the American Secular Union, which are fully inclusive of atheist perspectives. And so there is a, that kind of movement that you can trace in terms of institutions, in terms of organizations. Then there's the, there are the media platforms that are important. One is the lecture circuit. I mean, these are folks who spread the message by being itinerant lecturers. And, and, and as we've mentioned with Ingersoll, sometimes very popular lectures. They can really attract a crowd. Ingersoll attracts the biggest crowds coast to coast, but others attract crowds as well. People come out and listen. There's um, something very engaging about these free thinkers out there on the circuit. So they have that. Then they also have more and more journals. I mean, there were a number of deist publications uh, in the early republic, but after the Civil War, you get dozen and plus 
of these free thinking periodicals, some of which really have national circulations. They have uh, agents out there across the country promoting subscriptions. Two of the biggest are one in New York called The Truth Seeker and then another one in Boston called Bo The Boston Investigator. But there are other local papers out there that have more regional um, subscription bases. So they have that. They're growing that. Um, and then another media form that they begin to exploit, and I, I talk about this in the book, is cartooning. Um, they, they develop their own kind of secularist iconography, um, the truth seeker especially, and the cartoonist Watson Heston. So, the, so that, that actually expands their uh, media presence once they have a kind of visual iconography they can uh, disseminate out there. So that's really the kind of architecture of it is the you know this spread of these organizations but then also the building up of these these media forms for the spreading of the message so those are things that i concentrate on in the book um as kind of yeah the substructure of of the book right and we should also note too you're not telling a sort of whiggish history of this inevitable march of enlightenment one thing that your book is going to point out as we introduce people to some of these figures is that it's not the simple story of the f fading away of religious belief in in the light of rational uh, enlightenment or something uh, the the story is a bit more mixed up than that uh, there's interaction overlapping clashing all sorts of fun things um as we talk about this so let's dig into the first figure that you talk about uh, you mentioned him a little bit earlier samuel porter putnam and you give him the title the secular pilgrim uh why the secular pilgrim well it's a it's a name he he liked to apply to himself and and i thought it was very apt. I mean, he starts off in the Congregationalist ministry. He's the son of, a, of an Orthodox Calvinist minister. He is reared in the heart of New England Orthodoxy. And so he, he takes as, as, as a template uh, of, of what the religious life is supposed to look like as, as a young man, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And so he, he knows what the Christian life what the, the saint's life is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to unfold, how you're supposed to persevere in the Christian life. So I juxtapose that commonplace Protestant story or allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, with the pilgrimage that Putnam pursues then after he moves away from the Congregationalist ministry and ultimately becomes an atheist and, and then sees himself as on this secular pilgrimage. And that is twofold. It's, it's, he's this itinerant lecturer. He travels endlessly all over the country and to England and to Canada preaching the secularist atheist message. But it's also an interior journey. Uh, it's, he, he writes a memoir about his religious life and he charts the, you know, what's going on, the critical experiences of his life. I mean, he has in the Civil War, when he's a soldier in the Civil War, he has an epiphanal experience of Jesus, and he becomes really an evangelical at that point. But then 15, 17 years on after the Civil War, he has an epiphanal encounter with Robert Ingersoll that is a second conversion experience where he, he moves over um, to the side of the infidels and free thinkers. So it's that kind of secular pilgrimage too, an interior journey. It's both that outward journey around the country as a free thinking lecture and then this interior progress that he's making. One, he would see it as a pro he would see it as a progress. One of the interesting elements of his chapter were was the discussion about his views on the dangers of sentimentalism, which is kind of connected to his early conversion experience. Talk about that just a little bit. Right. So he sees part of the problem within Christianity, but also within his Unitarianism when he passes over into that. He has a kind of transcendental register where he where he's looking for religious truth through religious feelings. And that's what he's kind of holding on to, a sense of being awestruck um, in, in nature, say over a sunset or the, tr or the whispering of the trees, a kind of awe-inspiring experience, a kind of transcendental experience in nature, and that this is linked to him to religious feeling. And what he comes to see um, when he becomes an unsentimental atheist is that that religious move had been wrong, that he had vested far too much in religious feeling. And now he saw himself as having come into this cold, unblinking world of reason. 
and that that was the source of his grounding. So it was an express disengagement with religious feeling, both of the evangelical variety, but also of the transcendental variety, the kind of Emersonian, Thoreauvian currents that he had become familiar with as well. It's so interesting to see his secular pilgrim stories very much an inversion of a conversion narrative to Christianity or to some sort of belief in God, where he even presents himself as backsliding toward belief again at certain points. Right. Yeah, no, he, he does see that, right? So it is, it's reversed in all kinds of ways. It's, he takes that template of the Pilgrim's Progress and he stands, it's, stands it's on its head. And the figures in his life who trouble him especially are the ones who backslide into belief as he would see it. So he has this very good friend, this companion, George Cheney, who's making the same journey he's making from a kind of evangelical roots into the Unitarian ministry, and then a free-thinking unbeliever. And, and they're on the same journey. The only problem is George Cheney keeps journeying and then becomes a spiritualist and an occultist. And then, you know, Putnam can't have anything to do with him, writes him out of the history of secularism, out of the history of free thought. Even though Cheney was a golden boy order in the movement, who was more prominent than Putnam in many ways at the time. So, so it's interesting, right? It's the backslider into belief that Putnam then cannot tolerate, cannot make sense of. He wants this to be a unidirectional journey. And as we, we were saying earlier, it's a lot more complicated than that. There are plenty of people that get to where Putnam gets, and then they go somewhere else into one other religious movement or another. And so that's a big part of this story too. It's so interesting to see that. I mean, the impulse, it's like this human impulse to to tell a certain type of story. And then when people start escaping the bounds of that story, to the temptation is to erase them. And you, we've seen that um, in religious accounts of people converting and then falling away from a particular faith. And we also see it here in these uh, sec the secular pilgrim stories sort of do that same sort of selective editing. So overall, what was right. your main takeaway from Putnam in terms of like – using him as a representation of an overall aspect of the village atheist. I, I think this idea of a secular pilgrimage, that, that you can create a kind of secular narrative about your life and about your journey from a religious grounding to an irreligious grounding, that was the overarching point for me. Obviously, there are other things going on there too. I mean, his life ends tragically. Um, he, uh, he dies uh, in this gas leak with this other young free-thinking woman and becomes scandalous. So there are a lot of people who see t at the end of his life a kind of free love scandal that kind of ruins his reputation in an enduring way. And there's a huge fight over that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's hard to, hard to ignore the scandal entirely uh, and, and just and, – and I don't ignore it. But I would still say that it's this other th plotting that matters, the way in which he creates an irreligious narrative, that story of pilgrimage into unbelief that inverts the classic pilgrimage story within Protestantism. And it's interesting. This is one of the ways you would weave this story in with a later chapter, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but the, the sort of ideas about sexual – freedom and, and sort of thing that, that were associated with free thinkers. And, and so you do find ways to sort of, yeah, while this chapter doesn't emphasize that, you do talk about it and then you tie it in where it's discussed a little bit later on. So right. uh, people can keep listening. We'll uh, get to that part two. But next up is this cartoonist. This is really interesting. The cartoonist Watson Heston. And I think this was the first um, part of the book I heard about because you spoke at the Mormon History Association and presented a, a paper about uh, Watson and some of the research that you'd been doing. So uh, secularist people, free thinkers had a few big cultural heroes like Thomas Paine and Robert Ingersoll we've mentioned. And then, but there were a few nobodies who sort of had the opportunity to join their ranks as well-known figures. Watson Heston is one of these. He's an Ohio artist, and, and you're right, he had a lot of hard luck. Uh, talk a little bit about Watson Heston. I mean, Heston, in many ways, became the figure I could not get out of my head. I mean, I just became absorbed with him, probably way too absorbed. I was collecting <laughs> all of his cartoons and cataloging them. He, more than a thousand of these cartoons. Did you get uh, to see any of his actually hand-drawn ones at all? No, I don't think any of them survive. I haven't, I haven't come across any of them. Um, he was an artist. I haven't come across any artwork that survives of his. So um, that's a shame. It is, it is a shame. I, I, you know, maybe someday something will surface, <laughs> but I have not, I have not seen anything. Maybe the book in foregrounding him will 
will uh, cause someone to, to yeah. look through their attic or look through their collections and find out that they actually have something of his. Um, yeah, so 1,200 or more of these uh, irreligious cartoons for the truth seeker between 1885 and 1900. Um, and they have this rough hewn quality to them, and I mean, they're richly satiric. He has all kinds of different targets, um, all kinds of ways of dramatizing why free thinking ways of being in the world are vastly superior to religious ways of being in the world. So uh, I wanted to to think then about the visual culture of unbelief, the visual culture of secularism, and I don't think anybody much – had paid attention to that before. No one had really noticed how popular Heston had become in these circles and how he did in many ways come to rival Ingersoll uh, in reputation, a whole different medium, a whole different outlet of expression, but that many of the folks who are reading The True Seeker really look to those cartoons as embodiments as encapsulations of what it was like to be a free thinker in American culture, what it was like to be a village atheist in American culture. So and because he had so many, you could really try to tell a story through his cartoons, not only of his own life, but of the whole world of unbelief. I mean, there was all these different facets of unbelief that he covered, including, uh, you mentioned that the talk I gave at the Mormon History Association, including his fascination with Mormons, sometimes identifying with them as a persecuted minority and solidarity against this Protestant majority, and sometimes being a predictable critic, um, you know, sharing in the Protestant tropes of criticism of Mormonism. So, so you could, you know, pursue that angle, but any number of angles. I mean, he, with that many cartoons, there's hardly a facet of secularism and unbelief you can't find documented in his artwork. And this artwork was usually spread around through these newspapers that you mentioned earlier, or the journals that you mentioned earlier. Right? Was it in the Free Thinker? Right. He he's uh, he's or mostly in this one called the Truth Seeker. Yeah, that's is it. The, the main venue, but they are published in others as well. There's one in Kansas called the Free Thought of Deal. Some of his artwork shows up there. There's one in Kentucky called the Bluegrass Blade. Some of his work shows up there, and then it's pirated elsewhere, including in British Free Thought materials. So. So uh, it starts circulating widely in these circles, but its main home is in the Truth Seeker. And then they create these cartoon books out of the ones that are published week to week. And so they have compilations of his best cartoons, too. They have actually four volumes of his cartoons that they publish separately, and these are some of the best-selling books in these circles in these decades. And despite all that, all the best sellers and, and all of that, you also write about how this did not make him a wealthy person by any stretch. No, he, you know, he, he was down on his luck as an artist to begin with. You know, he, he itinerated, tried to paint portraits and finally settled in Carthage, Missouri and tried to make a living as a photographer and artist and what didn't have much luck at that. Um, so it was a, a fairly impoverished existence. Then he, he gets lucky, gets this connection to the truth seeker, but they never pay him very well. I mean, it's a really, uh, as far as I can tell, just a, a very small wage for this artwork. Um, it lets him get by in the world, but it certainly doesn't make him a wealthy man. And then when the relationship falls apart around 1900, he supposedly is cheated out a fair amount of money by the editor at the magazine. At least his, his defenders think that. So he then you know, loses his house and ends up in even more even dire uh, conditions. And so when he dies in 1905, his health had never been great. His economic uh, circumstances had always been tough. Um, he really is in uh, very poor shape and is kind of surviving on the largesse of those who identified with him as a great free thinker, people who establish a fund to try to support him and his, his wife in their um, forlorn uh, condition there in Carthage. So it never makes him wealthy. It makes him notorious, but it doesn't make him secure, that's for sure. Mm. And for all of his talk of progress and liberty that he would depict in these cartoons, you also talk about how he actually remained quite blind, and perhaps this was of his time, but quite blind to minority rights more broadly. So as you pointed out, sometimes his cartoons would leverage Mormons as a criticism against the broader Protestant establishment. But he also had some cartoons that uh, he had, you know, B.H. Roberts being forbidden from entering Congress because he's got this three-headed 
dog that's called polygamy that he's dragging in and this sort of thing. But also I'm right. thinking more and talking about in terms of his depiction of women and African Americans, which to modern sensibilities could be sort of shocking. Yeah, definitely. Now, free thinkers could gr agree on their secularist agenda, strict church state separation, a kind of materialist worldview, the progress of science and things like that. But when it came to other controversies in the culture, the Mormon question, race question, women's rights, they were very divided. And, you know, some of them took a progressive view and were in solidarity with Mormons, with women's rights, um, with African Americans uh, on civil rights questions. But Heston had, at best, an ambivalent relationship on all three fronts. Yeah. Uh, that, so, so on the race question, occasionally there was a sense of solidarity. Uh, with African Americans, you know, anti-lynching cartoons. But much of the time, he just has the same stereotype that so many free thinkers have, where they associate African Americans with primitivism, with excess enthusiasm, with a kind of ignorant views about the natural world. So they, he would use African American figures as stand-ins for kind of unenlightened views. And he never pictured an African-American freethinker, an African-American um, in the same way that he pictured Ingersoll or, some, or Putnam or some of these other infidel lecturers. I mean, his ideal prototype for the freethinker, for the unbeliever, was a white man. And he just didn't – He and the same thing basically went for women as well. He did not picture distinct women as free thinkers. Um, and he did the same went for African Americans. It was one of the most fascinating so, parts of your analysis was when you actually just, you know, it wasn't anything he was actively saying per se, especially I'm thinking with regard to women, it was just he would use women as symbols of like weakness or, um, you know, uh, vulnerability right. in this. And, and it was always the white man as this symbol of strength and and rational thought uh, and, and so right. it, these assumptions were smuggled into the cartoons they they weren't reflected on right i mean occasionally again he could express contempt for religious views of women that he saw as subjugating them or as oppressive so he could draw satiric images of saint paul and his prescriptions of women as teachers or as speakers or, or or leaders so he could he could do that but he then would turn around and draw cartoons that showed a, a genuine fear that all these church women might get the right to vote mm -hmm. and then make it all that much harder for these manly infidels to have standing in the world and to, to forward their views about strict church separation or about um, a scientific worldview or those kinds of things. So, yeah, so it's this this twofold quality. On the one hand, he wants to critique Christianity for its benightedness on women's rights. And then on the other hand, he is profoundly anxious that, you know, women are going to be so religious that if they do get the right to vote, that they're going to vote in more restrictions for infidels and free thinkers. So there's that. And yeah, so it just is in the cartoons, that deep ambivalence that comes out time and again, kind of association of, of women with effeminacy and weakness, with superstition. So yeah, he's not a great partner on those issues. And there would be there would be free thinkers who, who were, including a number of women who were leaders in the movement, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, free thinkers who really were very clear on issues of women's rights. Watson Heston is not one of those people. And another point that you use Watson Heston to bring out is the disagreement that existed among secularist proponents or atheistic proponents or free thinking proponents who disagreed on particular tactics that should be used. So these cartoons were sometimes brash. They were embarrassing to some people. They were very popular. And so there was disagreement about whether this sort of visible incivility, uh, the term that you mm -hmm. use, was appropriate or not or would achieve the ends that they wanted. Yeah, that was that was one of the big fights they had over the cartoons. The majority of subscribers who wrote in defended his pugnacity. They thought this is exactly what we want. We want someone who goes after in an aggressive way Christian 
views of the world. The Christians had never treated free thinkers very well, and it was their due to be treated uncivilly. And they, the harsher and more direct, more pugnacious system was the better. There were others, though, who said this was a horrible tactic. It was just going to drive people away. Nobody was going to, you know, come to be free thinkers be by way of insult and abuse and ridicule. So they thought it was a tactically a mistake. Um, they thought from a standpoint of kind of manners and civility and refinement, it was a mistake. And so they quarreled with him and the editor's decisions time and again about that. And, in, you know, and that's one of the debates we still see um, very much in the early 21st century is that that issue of whether free thinkers, the new atheists, should be out there satirizing religious people or whether they should show greater sensitivity to religious feelings. Um, and so this kind of the way in which cartooning still is an art is this flashpoint of controversy, and it's a flashpoint on that very issue, whether this is a, a right new atheists have to ridicule or whether ridicule should be reined in both as tactically but also out of respect for religious people's feelings um, yeah, and I sensitivity. I think, and I think listeners could definitely unpack the sort of connections between those discussions and discussions that happen today as well. Um, we're speaking today with Lee Eric Schmidt about his book, Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. So that was Watson Heston. Now we're talking about the blasphemer, Charles B. Reynolds. And you mentioned him a little bit earlier. He was a long-serving Seventh-day Adventist preacher, and he took his revival meeting craft and turned it to preaching a new secular gospel instead. So he would use the same sort of tactics. He would have a tent set up. He would go around and have sort of revival-type meetings and, and give lectures this way. And this landed him in legal trouble. So let's talk about the legal issues a little bit more. So this had been a long-running debate in American culture more broadly in European culture, uh, a history here of, of blasphemy prosecutions. And, and then, you know, after the revolution, there was more and more question about this. I mean, given the First Amendment, you know, was blasphemy still something that could be recognized as a category in American law? And most of the time, state legislatures thought so and kept them on the books. And there are a good number of blasphemy trials in the first few decades of the 19th century. Some of them became famous. Many of them were just small time blasphemers who went, got put away in a county jail for a few months. <laughs> small time um, blasphemers. <laughs> yeah, people, you know, somebody probably got drunk, said something wrong, got put away for a month or two in the county jail and, you know, didn't make headlines, right? And the or, kind of things they would say would just be like, I don't believe in God, or would it be more specific, like, I hate God? Like, what uh, kind of. Well, they would say things. I mean, you know, the, the a kind of line that would get someone in, a famous one was this guy, Thomas Ruggles. Um, who, you know, drunkenly announced that the Virgin Mary was a whore okay, um, yeah, and, be... and that kind of thing. So they, you know, pretty ribald suggestions and um, they would get locked up over or say something derogatory about Jesus or the Bible. And those kinds of blasphemers, people didn't really come to the defense of. I mean, nobody's going to come to Ruggles' defense, yeah. really. I mean, you might think blasphemy shouldn't be prosecuted, but nobody's going much going to embrace him. The kind of blasphemers who get embraced are like Abner Neelan in Boston in the 1820s when people are prosecuting him because he's he's a minister. His his heresies are more theological, right? He's a universalist, who, you know, who says he just doesn't believe in the Christian God um, in the way other people do. And so when he's tried for blasphemy, many people come to his defense. Unitarians. Uh, transcendentalists will come to his defense and um, and celebrate him as a blasphemer, but not people like Ruggles. I mean, that just that th those those weren't the cases that um, free thinking intellectuals usually embrace as their own. Now Reynolds is sort of in the middle. He clearly is provoking people in his tent lectures and has this spiel about the Bible and about how silly Christians are and how silly these Bible stories are, and it could it. You know, it, it is a highbrow theological disagreement. So he's definitely there's a popular satire performance that he's doing. It's a little theatrical. Um, yeah. yeah, it's theatrical, and he's got this tent, and so the tent is out there in public. I mean, right. I think part of his problem is he has a tent. He thinks of himself as this Adventist evangelist who's now a free thinker evangelist. So he has a tent, and he thinks this, yep. this is kind of a big oratorical show, a revival meeting for secularism, and that tent is open. So people could hear what he has to say 
you know, throughout the village, people outside of it. If you're in a small lecture hall, you know, there isn't a way in which, you know, the children are just going to wander in and hear this. I mean, but with a tent, it's open, it's public. And so I, I think that's a part of it. It's, it's how his irreligion is performed that gets him into trouble. And um, so he is arrested and tried. Well, he's initially the, the big thing that the freethinkers latch onto is that he, the, uh, he provokes a riot in Booton, New Jersey. And everything and is legal in New Jersey, though, I've been told. Yeah, so. That's right. It's a, <laughs> so he provokes a riot. His lecture is shut down. The town won't let him ever lecture again. His tent is destroyed by the mob. And so it becomes a cause celeb on the freethinker side because look what look what these bigoted Christians of New Jersey did. They mobbed him. They destroyed his tent. He can't get any satisfaction before the law. Um, for the nobody's going to bring any of the, the the mob leaders to trial. Nobody's going to charge them with anything, but they are going to charge him with blasphemy and provoking this civil unrest. So, so the, it winds its way through, and eventually, in, Robert Ingersoll takes the case and gives a very dramatic courtroom performance. A, you know, a little bit of the Scopes trial before the Scopes trial, having this big order doing the defense, and so. He nonetheless is convicted, given a token fine, and then you know sent on his way, and he eventually moves west. As I said, he's out in Oregon and Washington. So it's, but it's it's a you know it's a big trial. It gets a lot of attention all the more because Ingersoll's involved in it. But it raises this the bigger question, you know, is this is that question around irreligious freedom? Does he have a right to say these kind of things about religion? To say these kind of things about the Bible? Right and. So does that fall into the category of free speech or not? And those, those are the kind of debates that are going on there. And there are, as I, as I say, there are Protestant ministers and Protestant lay people who come to his defense that really do prioritize the value of free speech over the notion of blasphemy. So he has defenders. He has defenders in Protestant ranks on this point as well as fierce Protestant critics at this point. So again, that's where it gets complicated. And then I try to use him as a, a, as a leaping off point, the fact that he gets mobbed. To the question is, well, how much violence really was aimed at these kinds of um, lecturers or at free thinkers and infidels in general? Was this the exception, um, this kind of mob violence? Or was it indicative of, of wider patterns of violence or threats of violence aimed at freethinkers and atheists? And there I get a sense of a, of a mixed picture. This is the only time Reynolds is mobbed. There are a couple of other times where he's threatened with violence. This is the only time he's mobbed. And he lectured hundreds of times. But there are enough other episodes of these kinds of lecturers um, being subject to attack or being charged with blasphemy uh, to say that there is a pattern there um, and that it's not simply an exceptional case. This New Jersey case is not just this kind of one-off blasphemy trial. There are enough other episodes out there to say there is an element of violence to which these freethinkers and unbelievers were subject. Yeah, so it was interesting to see in the book in the conclusion sort of lets people know how things played out in the 21st century a little bit as well, although it's not a focus of the book. But people can pick up village atheists and see how those things played out through the 20th century as well. A lot of the legal issues have been settled. There's still some questions. Now it revolves around things like whether the Ten Commandments could be posted at a courthouse or, you know, those type of things. Um, right, sure. Yeah. But the final figure that you talk about is actually uh, the only woman uh, featured in the book. Uh, it's Almina Drake Slanker. Uh, and you refer to her as the obscene atheist. So spend a minute on her story. Sure. So Slinker is is an interesting character. All these characters are fascinating. I, I think Slinker in many ways is um, the most fascinating of all. Um, she has Quaker roots. She becomes disaffected from Quakerism. Her father was tossed out of the Quaker meeting um, near the, they're near Poughkeepsie, New York. And uh, so she grows up in the 1850s without any real sense of religious identity anymore. And in that decade, she starts identifying herself actually as an atheist. She's one of the one of the really early ones um, in 1850s. Just come out and say, "I'm a I'm an atheist." Not only, you know, and then 
more specifically, a woman atheist, which was even rarer, there is uh, one model for this that she has, Ernestine Rose, who's a lecturer on the women's rights circuits and uh, free thinking circuits um, before Slinker. And she's a model for her as a woman atheist. But Slinker really is out there in that regard. And it, it, it is – there aren't that many atheists in general, right? I mean this is a, this is a small vocal minority, but you know, not a big right. one. Yeah. And it's an even smaller group when you get to the, to those who are woman atheists. Yeah, and she's so a minority Slinker, in the minority. She's the minority in the minority, and 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 there is a kind of double outrage that goes with this because women are associated with piety, with the care of the home, with a domesticity, and they are supposed to model those domestic Christian virtues and rear these godly children and godly sons who will go out there and be good citizens in the world. So this notion of a woman atheist, this is truly frightening prospect um, to people. And Slinker sometimes plays that for all it's worth, just plays up the outrage, plays up the controversy. And other times she tries to, to make a safer image for herself, that, it, that, that a woman atheist is not such a frightening thing, that a woman atheist is just as domestic as a, as a Christian mother. And she emphasizes that she's indeed a mother and that she always tends to the household and cares deeply about rearing good, upstanding children. And she produces literature for free-thinking children that mirrors the literature you would have for for Protestant children in, 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 all, in all kinds of ways. So she, she sometimes plays up the outrage and sometimes it's like, no, this is safe. You can come around to actually tolerating these free thinking women because we're as, um, as pure and upstanding uh, as anyone else. So she plays that on, on both sides. So, but the reason I call her the obscene atheist is because she moves on to these wider alliances that a number of free thinkers in the period explore with marriage reformers and those interested around in issues of reproductive rights. And she forms those alliances and becomes notorious in those circles. Basically, anyone who's doing this is, you know, exploring that kind of literature and making these kinds of claims her, um, are controversial. Um, but she I, I allies herself with this physician, Sarah B. Chase, and her journal, The Family Physiologist, and in that journal writes explicitly on issues around contraception and reproductive rights, sex within marriage, and how that should look or not look. And so she, she's taking up issues that are um, really uh, controversial, and that calls her to the attention of Anthony Comstock who's the great vice crusader of the era, and his focus is on diminishing obscenity um, and access to obscene reading materials uh, in American life. And so, and as a devout Christian, he really doesn't like infidels too. It's harder for him to get them on blasphemy charges, but a little easier once they start doing the marriage reform stuff to get them on obscenity charges. And that's exactly the, the path he pursues with Slinker, um, his agents pursue with Slinker, and she's arrested on obscenity charges and goes to trial for that. And so I then use her uh, to see how this becomes a pattern in the late 19th century, that when you want to go after these infidels, these unbelievers, the most effective legal strategy is to find a way to charge them with obscenity. They're much more likely to go to jail if you charge them with obscenity than if you charge them with blasphemy or you know, being a public nuisance or something like that. So that's the, that's the, that becomes the big legal strategy. It's fairly effective. A good number of them do go to jail in this period. Um, so that's Comstock's um, modus operandi is to level these obscenity charges. So Slinker becomes a window in on that. And then I'm able to tell some other stories about other editors and lecturers, men and women, who are brought up on obscenity charges uh, in the period. And then how does Elmina's story end? After this uh, obscenity trial, I mean, she spends some time in jail, is convicted, she, but she, she does go then back um, to her little town in Virginia, which is not a, a hospitable place to be a woman atheist, this little town, Snowville, Virginia, um, where she has a witch-like reputation for her unbelief. But she goes back to that and she does what she did before, which is she writes – for these uh, national free-thinking periodicals, periodicals like The Truth Seeker and Boston Investigator, and then a handful of other periodicals um, that she's um, interested in. And she has a network of correspondents that she's constantly writing to and linking up 
And so she she keeps doing what she was doing before. There there's some drop off in how much she she cares about the sexual physiology questions and things like that. But she goes back to being what she was before. That this is one thing Comstock and his agents are unable to do. They can throw a wrench in the system for these people, but only occasionally do they really successfully end these people's careers. I mean, they really do end Sarah Chase, her colleague's career, fairly effectively. Um, John Lant is another one, an editor, free-thinking editor. They really do end his career. But slinkers, they don't. And so she goes back, and then she lives out her life in, in Snowville, Virginia, and dies in you know, in 1908, and there's some celebration of her as one of these free speech leaders, but um, she's, you know, she's not famous at the end of her life. She's sort of dropped off the, the radar screen in that la- over the last 10 years of her life by then. When we come back, we'll kind of tie the story up to the present time a little bit and talk a little more about your role as the author of this book. Uh, We're speaking today with Lee Eric Schmidt. He's the Edward C. Mallinckrodt Distinguished University Professor at the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. He's author of the highly acclaimed book, Hearing Things, Religion, Illusion, and the American Enlightenment, among other books. But his latest book is called Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. We'll be right back. I've both lost and found God a hundred times over, writes Ashley May Hoyland in her book, 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly, stories for restless souls like you who desire to know God more deeply. This Latter-day Saint author and artist explores the complexities of everyday faith through story and picture. For Hoyland, laughter, sorrow, and creativity emerge as gospel principles alongside faith, hope, and charity. 100 Birds Taught Me to Fly is part of the Living Faith series at Brigham Young University's Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. Visit bit.ly slash 100 birds to learn more. We're back with Lee Eric Schmidt. He joins us to talk about his new book, Village Atheists, How America's Unbelievers Made Their Way in a Godly Nation. And this book is from Princeton University Press. Okay, Lee, let's talk a little bit about the village atheist as a figure sort of faded away in American thought. There was this period of nostalgia for the village atheist, and they came to sort of personify this gutsy descent from stultifying pieties, you say, uh, or they were also seen as a necessary challenge to majoritarian religion. So even some religious people, people of Christian faith or other faiths, could appreciate some of the things that village atheists stood for in terms of oppression against religious minorities and other minorities. So they became this sort of appreciated figure later on, but they seemed to fade out through the 1950s and so on. So how would you, how would you tie the end of that golden era to kind of the present day? What kind of shifts have you seen between then and now? Yeah, I mean, there is a way in which the village atheist is, you know, that that golden period for them is is the late 19th century, maybe right into the early 20th, a little bit. But after that, there is a kind of way in which it becomes a literary representation and they it stops being connected to these flesh and blood lectures and dissidents. Um, the people the the 19th century and so it does it becomes more of a literary device say in Sinclair Lewis's Elmer Gantry there's a there's a village atheist so it's it's a literary device and you know by the 1950s and 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 so on there one thing that happens of course is that unbelief in atheism does get all the more marginalized in that era where there is a kind of sense that just to be an American citizen, you need to profess some belief in God. You need to be, as Will Herbert said, a Protestant and Catholic or a Jew. That's just how you, you show your American citizenship is to be some kind of faithful person. And the atheist just fell, fell outside of it. And there's, there's just more of a sense that um, there aren't such characters or they shouldn't be such characters. Now, you know, that's that's the big picture. Underneath that, there's still pre- plenty of these free thinking uh, dissonance in the period. And a lot of them, you know, are, are these activists still and they're taking a, a, a kind of legal approach to their quandaries. And so somebody like um, Vashti McCollum, who, who was one of the first free thinking, atheistic, humanist plaintiffs to really succeed. She takes uh, an Illinois school district to court over their religious release time program. Her son is being 
she feels being excluded because he they don't they're not religious and yet there are these catechesis classes being done in the school and making him feel like an outsider so she takes them to court loses in illinois it gets to the supreme court and she actually wins that that release time program is unconstitutional and so here she is she's this free thinking local activist and then once you get into that you realize oh her father arthur cromwell and Rochester was also one of these village atheist free thinking <laughs> activists. And, you know, and that's just a little step removed from Arvid Ingersoll. So they're, you know, just beneath the surface a little bit. You see that those kind of activists survive, that kind of village atheist is there, Cromwell, Vashti McCollum. And then you kind of start seeing, you know, other figures who are also activists like this, who are, who are pressing their cases. Um, making themselves a kind of nuisance in the courts by bringing, you know, everything from the adding under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, which happens in the 1950s, bringing cases against that, bringing cases against the release time programs, bringing cases against uh, the fact that conscientious objection is is only for members of religious communities, primarily for members of historic peace churches, and making a claim that a secular humanist. Um, ethical value should have just as much standing as someone from one of those um, Christian uh, traditions. So that, that's where you see it. You see them, they're, they're still there, they're still active, and they're actually finally getting some traction in the courtroom. So I, I think that's the legacy. And it's so it's not this kind of separate group of activists in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, but it's a group of people who are drawing on these earlier traditions of activism and the, from the National Liberal League and the American Secular Union and continuing them. And then finally, they're in a legal context where they get a hearing and they're not just dismissed um, out of hand. So I think that's, that's an important uh, legacy. Um, and then it continues. I mean, they're, they're, you know, in some ways think, oh, well, it's settled now. They, they have these, they win these Supreme Court cases right. and believers and non-believers on equal terms. Well, no, actually it's not so settled because uh, these decisions aren't self-enforcing. And so you find someone like this free thinker in South Carolina, Herb Silverman, who's a mathematics professor at the College of Charleston. And when he tries to become a notary public in South Carolina in the 1990s, South Carolina doesn't want to let him become a notary public. Even though that's supposedly a settled issue, they reject his application because he's an atheist. Um, and so he has to go to court, and eventually he gets to be a notary public in South Carolina. And be, because that should have been a settled issue, it's just that South Carolina didn't want to treat it as a settled issue. So it keeps going. So there are these traditions of protest and secular activism that continue then into the 21st century and are kind of the background to this emergence, this flowering of the so-called new atheists in the 21st century, which once you have a little historical sense of this, they don't seem so new, actually. So that's, but I, I guess that's how it kind of plays out. There, there, there are some continuities here. There are ways in which the new atheism and these new secular coalitions of the 21st century are drawing in substantial ways on this history, are in continuous conversation. Uh, with these village atheists of the 19th century. Yeah, the conclusion of the book does a good job giving a, a pretty quick overview of that. And one could even imagine a similar book covering some of the figures you briefly mentioned here, uh, sort of bringing that up to the present and the idea that the new atheists in some ways aren't all that new. I think that's really fascinating. Another thing that fascinated me are your own stakes in this discussion. So um, you're a, a scholar of religion. Um, how do you navigate sort of when you're relating a history, avoiding casting theological judgments or bringing your own sort of religious sensibilities into the picture. Talk about your own religious sensibilities, whatever they are, um, and how that relates to the actual uh, scholarship that you produce. Right. Well, I mean, I do, of course, I, I try as a historian to create empathic yet critical perspective on these characters and kind of as a, as a historical approach to my characters. But, you know, I, there's no doubt ways in which one's own religious biography intersects with what one ends up studying. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm a liberal Protestant by background, kind of uh, a Methodist, social gospel Methodist by background. So there are a lot of liberal Protestant assumptions and fascinations that I, uh, that I bring to my work. And so, I mean, on this, on this particular case, I think that that's where you're most likely going to see solidarity, right? You're going to, with the, this 
secular minority is that there's a, a valuing of minority rights that, l- that many of these liberal Protestants are ready to join up with secularists on these matters of church and state for the protection of minority rights. And so there is a natural alliance there often between, you know, a liberal Protestants and um, these secular activists. So um, that's a place where, you, you, you know, you see these these, you know, from the early 19th century on, where it's people like Theodore Parker and Ralph Waldo Emerson who think Abner Nealon needs to be defended, mm-hmm. you know, through the Reynolds trial in the 1880s, that's, that's where alliances are likely to be forged. And so, you know, it's it's probably not all that surprising <laughs> that someone <laughs> with this liberal Protestant background would um, be drawn to these uh, secularist figures on the edges who are fighting this case uh, as they see it for minority rights. So I'd say, you know, there's, there's, there are affinities there. I, I'm not, I don't think the book's driven by that. Right. Uh, but I, I think that there are affinities and I see it. I mean, I, there's a figure like Paul Blanchard who's, uh, who starts off as a, you know, a liberal Protestant minister. That's his background, congregationalist minister. He becomes infamous in the 1950s as an anti-Catholic or as a critic of um, Catholicism. But he makes this journey, though, beyond that liberal congregationalist background into a kind of secularist activism. And again, I think his biography also demonstrates those affinities. He's sometimes seen as kind of his criticism of Catholicism is entirely Protestant. Actually, his criticism of Catholicism is Protestant, but it's also intensely secularist. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of development, those affinities um, that you see over time. I think that that you know you have to be very you have to be critical of those affinities and you have to be reflective about those affinities um, just as just as you are about these characters along the way and the limitations of vision of somebody like Watson Heston or something like that same kind of critical perspective you need to bring to bear on your own suppositions and on your own background when you're doing this kind of work so I try. Um, to have that kind of critical awareness. We're, we're usually not as critically aware as we think we are or th- that we need to be. I, I, well, I'll, I'll second what you said. I mean, having read the book, um, I, I think, yeah, th- some of the themes that you personally had the most affinity with are definitely there in the book, but I don't think – I don't think they were unduly foregrounded. Uh, you know, people pick up this book and as they read through it can think about that and and they'll see a lot of other things uh, in your discussion that touch on things like the right way to present your opinion publicly, that talk about um, what it's like being in, in a minority position and, and how uh, some blindness can exist in those positions as well. And there's a lot of things that people can apply to their contemporary experiences, I think, by by reading books like this. And so uh, I think that's great. The last thing I'd want to ask is this book's kind of an outgrowth of earlier work that you've done. You've written a book on the making of American spirituality, the sort of liberal Protestant context in which these village atheists uh, arose. Are are your next projects similar outgrowths or are you going in a different direction next? It's a little early to say, but usually when, when you're done with a project, at least this is what I found, is that there's some loose ends. You haven't been able to cover all the things you would have liked to have covered. And so you often start there. I mean, I think that was true when I wrote that book, um, Restless Souls, on, on American spirituality. There were some loose ends there that then led me into this project and a, and a, and a biographical project on uh, Ida Craddock. And I see some I see some here, too. I mean, one of the things that fascinates me and I, I didn't write about here are the kind of community-oriented dimensions of free thinking. I mean, there's all this concern in in the 21st century among the new atheists and in a kind of constructive humanism, Mm -hmm. you know, these humanist chaplaincies that you see at places like Harvard or, or Yale or USC, where they're trying to think about in this world of growing religious disaffiliation, what could community look like on secular terms, on humanist terms? And I see, you know, there are all kinds of ways in which this history can speak to those issues as well. I mean, this little town in Missouri, liberal Missouri, where they try to found a, a secularist community and what that looks like, or a brotherhood, uh, you know, uh, of agnostics that try to create rituals for people who are beyond the churches now. I mean, try to create funerals and marriages and naming ceremonies for people who are no longer connected to religious communities. Those kinds of experiments, as frail as they are, are nonetheless 
suggestive, I think, for people in the early 21st century are trying to think through issues about community and belonging in a time where religious disaffiliation is growing. And there is just a, you know, a question, like, what are these millennials going to do? Are they going to join anything? Is there, you know, <laughs> or is this all just fragmentation? So, um, yeah, so I think those kinds of questions linger for me. And um, I've got some files on that, but I can't promise I'm going to write any of it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do, I look forward to it. I, I should say, okay, well, I, uh, on a personal note, your work has strongly influenced uh, my own trajectory. Your book, Hearing Things, was a uh, pivotal uh, book for me in, in drawing me into religious studies and interested in the sort of questions that you're asking. So a personal note of gratitude to you for, the, for your work. Well, I appreciate that. I, it's great to hear. I, I'm glad to hear that. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Maxwell Institute podcast today, Lee. I've enjoyed it a lot. It's been a great conversation. Thank you.